If you'll turn to your scripture in your bulletin and meditate on it as I read it aloud. Acts 9, 26 to 31. Barnabas took Paul under his wing. After Paul left Damascus, he tried to join the disciples down in Jerusalem. But they all were all afraid of him. They didn't trust him one bit. And you and I wouldn't have trusted him either. Then Barnabas took Paul under his wing. Barnabas introduced Paul to the apostles and stood up for him. He told them how Paul had seen and spoken with the master Jesus on the Damascus road and how in Damascus itself he had laid his life on the line with his bold preaching in Jesus' name. After Paul was accepted as one of them, going in and out of Jerusalem with no questions asked, uninhibited as he preached in, as he preached as should be preached in the master's name then he ran afoul of a group called the Hellenists he had engaged in a running argument with the Hellenists who plotted his murder when his angels um, learned I'm sure that's a different word when his friends learned of the plot they got him out of town took him to Caesarea and then shipped him off to Damascus Things calmed down after that, and the church had smooth sailing for a while. All over the country, Judea, Samaria, Galilee, the church grew. They were permeated with a deep sense of reverence for God. The Holy Spirit was with them, strengthening them. They prospered wonderfully. It's really important to take people under our wing. When somebody goes to where you work and is learning a new job, it's, it's so important to take that person under your wing and, and help them with that new job. When a new neighbor comes into your community, buys a house near you, or is down the street, it's so important that you, you and I as Christians take people under our wing. Uh, I know that several of you have several people that you're literally taking them under your wing to help them in their Christian faith, to help them to adjust to the loss of a family member or the spouse. Uh, you take them under your wing to help them if they need their yard mode. But I want to encourage you to be like Barnabas today. Now Paul... We discussed last Sunday that when he was in Damascus and a new Christian, brand new, he was an unstoppable force. He was so excited that his life had been turned around. And the same thing happened in Jerusalem. Paul was an unstoppable force in Jerusalem, just like he'd been in Damascus. And remember... You and I would not be believers if it was not for Paul and his unstoppable dedication to Jesus as the Messiah. Paul's faith that Jesus was the Messiah for whom the entire world and the Jewish people have waited for so many centuries just drove Paul on and on and on. And... Uh, one of my most beloved people in the church, other than the Apostle John, who was closest to Jesus, is Barnabas. Now, I know that virtually every one of you have heard about Paul over and over again, all of Paul's journeys. But Barnabas is one of these forgotten men of God in the book of Acts and in the Bible, in the New Testament. And... Barnabas is really my hero. And as we read about Barnabas, it's wonderful. Uh, Acts 4.36 says he, his birth name was Joseph. And he was a Levite from Cyprus, the island of Cyprus. But the Christians in Jerusalem gave him the nickname Barnava. Uh, that's a Greek word. And uh, you can see how the V and the B in English are very similar. And so that Barnaba became, in our English language, Barnabas, 
which means that Barnabas was an encourager. That's a Greek word, an encourager, one who calls people closer together in intimate relationships. In other words, Barnabas was a peacemaker. His name, that word Renava or Barnabas, is taken from the Greek word parakaleo, which means the same word, root word, as the Greek word for the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. In other words, the Holy Spirit in the Greek language, paraclete, means comforter, sustainer, enabler, uh, healer. It also means attorney, uh, which uh, a good attorney <laughs> that keeps us out of trouble when we haven't committed a crime. So we have a wonderful man full of the Holy Spirit who's a peacemaker. Now, if you and I were one of the apostles, we would literally be scared to death of Paul. He was arresting people, throwing them in prison. They heard reports in Damascus that he'd become a believer, but his past in Jerusalem was terrible. He had arrested all kinds of people in Jerusalem that were Christians. And then he was on his way to arrest more in Damascus, and the Holy Spirit came to him. So... This son of encouragement, is another translation for Barnabas' name, son of encouragement, he also put his life on the line. Now we hear a lot about Paul putting his life on the line in Damascus and putting his life on the line later on in, in Jerusalem and really all over the entire world at that time. But Barnabas put his life on the line. And he did it for Paul. And uh, the apostles listened to Barnabas. And it's wonderful, you know, that scripture we read. Then, then he could go in and talk to the apostles and the other people in the church. And, and then Paul was free to uh, really be a witness for Jesus in Jerusalem and to fellowship with other Christians. Now, uh, Later on in Acts, we see that Paul and Barnabas split. But uh, next Sunday, we're going to study a wonderful, wonderful experience that Paul and Barnabas had together, uh, leading a lot of people to Jesus before they, they, they split up. But Paul had a real strong opinions about things. And uh, the reason they split up was because in Antioch, Paul would not allow John Mark to go with them because earlier John Mark had abandoned him on a mission trip in Pamphylia. We don't know many of the details about that other than Paul really felt abandoned by Mark. But Barnabas, remember his name means reconciler, Barnabas reconciled with John Mark and when Paul and he had a disagreement about John Mark, Barnabas took John Mark to Cyprus with him and Paul took Silas with him and went to Syria. Now, in that scripture we just read, the Hellenists, Paul sort of had a running battle with the Hellenists. And let me explain who the Hellenists were. These were people who were either non-Jews who converted to Judaism, or there were Jewish people, I mean, who never didn't know the Aramaic language, and they spoke only Greek. Well, you know, the language you speak really influences you. And so here's a bunch of Jews that were either Greek-speaking Jews or Greek-speaking Greeks, and they had a tendency to add a lot of stuff that was Greek culture into Jewish faith because that was their culture and because they weren't really Jerusalem kind of Aramaic-speaking Jews. The main issue Paul had with them is that they wouldn't accept Jesus of Nazareth as a Messiah. And so Paul continued to have this running battle with them. And the same thing happened in Jerusalem that happened in Damascus. In Damascus, they put guards at every single gate, the Jewish people that were angry with him, and they were going to assassinate him. And the same thing happened. Paul and the church learned that the Hellenists were going to kill Paul in Jerusalem. 
Now, that tells you a little bit about Paul. He didn't, he didn't back down at all. He was willing to put his life on the line. Uh, I'll, I'll never forget a story. A friend of mine in Oklahoma, he was a lot like Paul. Pretty rugged individual. And when he found the Lord, he became really intense. And he, he tells this story. He's a great big old Oklahoma guy. Wears cowboy boots everywhere he goes. And he has an Oklahoma drawl as long as the Mississippi River. <laughs> And uh, he said this one guy he'd been witnessing to was working in a factory. So he went into the factory where the guy was working on heavy equipment. And he grabbed him by the, sh the coat. It was wintertime. I used to work in a factory in Oklahoma in the wintertime. And it got cold in that factory. No heat. And he grabbed that guy and asked him if he'd been born again and filled with the Holy Ghost. <laughs> and he said... I must have looked like a maniac to that guy because he screamed and ran out of his coat <laughs> and left me holding his coat. <laughs> and he says, I've calmed down later on as a Christian and I don't do things like that. But see, Paul was just like my friend in Oklahoma. He was really intense and uh, he scared people and he would argue with people and what was terrible about arguing with Paul is he memorized so much of the Old Testament of the Hebrew Scriptures that no matter what you said to him, he'd come back to you with the Scripture. And I don't know if you ever argued with anybody like that. We had a guy in seminary. He showed up one time, and at the end of the hour, we all wanted to kill him. We were all seminary students. And it was a real controversial issue. You, know, you have to get somebody... You have to get really mad to be a seminary student. You know, the Black Panthers came in and talked to us and yelled and screamed, and we didn't get mad at, him, at them. But when this guy came in, we got mad at him because he'd memorized so much of the Old Testament and the New Testament. It was a real controversial issue he was talking about, and we would ask him a question, and he'd never tell us how he felt. He'd just quote a scripture. So we'd ask him another question, he'd quote another scripture. That went on for an hour. At the end of that hour, we literally wanted to strangle the guy. I'm sure that's what went on with Paul. Paul knew so much of the, of the Hebrew scriptures, that, and he memorized so much, there was no way you could get around him when he was proving over and over again by scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. And it just infuriates people when you don't, have the ability to counter their argument. So the Jews in Damascus said at every city gate they were going to kill him. As soon as he went out of the city gates, they were going to assassinate him. The Hellenists developed a real serious plot to kill him in Jerusalem. And it's funny, this, the translation that I used for this is... Uh, when the Jews that were Christians learned of the plot, they got him out of town. I, you sort of miss this when you just read it the first time. They got him out of town to Caesarea, which was the port city. And they shipped him off to Tarsus. <laughs> uh, they got rid of him because he was raising so much trouble in the church. Now, you remember last Sunday we talked about how the Jews got Paul out of the city of Damascus by lowering him in a basket. They were saving themselves, too. They were saving Paul. But if anybody threatens to kill Paul, who was a Christian, then it's just a simple step to say, okay, now let's start killing the Christians in Damascus. And something very similar happened in Jerusalem. If somebody's riled up enough to kill Paul, then they're going to think seriously about killing the 12 apostles, and seriously about killing the other Christians. So they shipped him off. And, and Paul needed to calm down. Uh, if, I don't know what it is, but I have seen, I used to work in an alcohol and drug treatment center. Cocaine and, uh, addicts were the worst doing this, but potheads and alcoholics would do the same thing. 
after these people had come to a faith in God and they'd only been clean and sober like three or four days, they knew how to run the treatment center better than the professionals who ran it. <laughs> and Paul, at this point, was sort of like a cocaine addict, three days clean and sober. He, knew, he thought he knew how to witness about Jesus better <laughs> than the 12 apostles and all these other folks. And he just stirred up the people terribly in Damascus and stirred up the people terribly in Jerusalem. And you know, it took him about 12 years, if you read the book of Acts closely, about 12 years to calm down where he could become an effective Christian and take a deep breath every so often and, and really lead a lot of people to Jesus Christ. But even as a young Christian, Paul and Barnabas, as we'll discover next week, really led a lot of people to a wonderful faith in God. But today my focus is not on Paul. My focus is on someone you rarely hear about, Barnabas. Man, when I grow up, I want to be like Barnabas. You and I also need to be like Paul. We need to have this incredible dedication to be willing to put our life on the line. But we also need to have the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, the comforter, the person who can get along. You know, churches are made up of all different kinds of people. And some people in church are real strong leaders. Other people are more quiet. Uh, Barnabas knew how to work with everybody. And that's a wonderful goal for us as Christians. At our job, to learn how to get along with everybody at work, even though some people are very difficult and I've, I've written something down here which I want to read to you. I think it's pretty important. Do you quit serving God because someone in church is not easy to work with? No. You keep on serving God just like Barnabas and Paul did. They split up. One of them went with, Paul went with Silas. Barnabas went with John Mark. They continue to serve Jesus. Uh, the analogy I use many times is if an alcoholic walks into a bar and it's really unfriendly and people try to fight him and, and, and he likes to drink alcohol in bars, does an alcoholic keep going back to that same bar? No. But does he quit going to bars? No. He bounces around until he finds a bar where he feels really comfortable. I encourage you to do that with churches. Uh, if you find uh, the people where you worship, and I have done this myself. Uh, I attended a little church in Olathe, Kansas one time, and all of a sudden I became very uncomfortable. I wasn't wanted there. I found another church and worship God. And... Uh, it's really important that you and I don't let our anger, our resentment, our embarrassment, our humiliation, and our other emotions keep us from serving God. It's really, really important that we take our eyes off of people and put our eyes on Jesus. And you know, if we can't serve Jesus in one place, we know that isolated Christians are like isolated sheep. They will find a way to die. Uh, my uncle who raised sheep in Wyoming, he told me, and I mentioned this to you before, Ronnie, do you know what a sheep is? I said, I know you're going to tell me something, Uncle Leo. <laughs> what is a sheep like? And he says, a sheep is an animal looking for a place to die. <laughs> he was having coyotes and bald eagles and everything killing his sheep. He got out of the sheep business. And, and you and I, when we're isolated, we're like a sheep on the mountains of Wyoming, like my uncle's sheep. We're going to find a way to die when we're alone. It's really, really important that you and I fellowship with other Christians. And I know that's why you're here today. And as you fellowship with other Christians, let me encourage you today, in the name of Jesus Christ, be like Barnabas. Be an encourager. Be a healer. Barnabas forgave John Mark for abandoning Paul and Pamphylia. Forgive other people. 
Be a loving Christian and a reconciling Christian today. So in other words, when you're like Barnabas, the Holy Spirit can use you in a special way. And, and love is what following Jesus is all about. Love is what we come to when we come to receive communion. We don't come for our own good works. We come for the love of God and the mercy of God. And so let me encourage you to be merciful like Barnabas, loving like Jesus of Nazareth like Barnabas was, and forgiving like Barnabas was.